I'm going to find out a little bit more about these, these four things, uh, and then I will throw it open to you. Brian, let's start with you. What are you trying to do with PAX? What is it? PAX is, to start with, an idea. It's an idea that was awakened in me when I saw programs, possibly on Channel 4 News, from Burma in 2008. And I saw pictures of those orange-coated monks being bashed up by the police. And I knew, as you knew, that journalists weren't let into Burma and press photographers weren't let into Burma. Who took those pictures? Citizens. And then we saw similar pictures from citizens in Iran after the disputed election, then Kyrgyzstan, the year later, this year quite a lot from North Africa. So the question was, can one use the fact that this new form of citizen journalism is providing accurate, probably accurate, data about growing violence to prevent wars and genocides. And then I started looking around to see what else there was on the scene that might help this. And Ushahidi was one vital part. Actually, they know about how to design the algorithm that could collect the data. And Satellite Sentinel stroke UNISAT know how you can use satellite data to check or contradict the data that's uploaded. And I just thought my way around it. And one of the key questions for me is, you've obviously got to cover the whole world with this because you never know where the violence is going to erupt. I talked to people at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and they said that at any one time, you're liable to have to watch 75 places around the world, which are early warning, getting a bit bad, tension growing, and then maybe they break out into war or genocide. Um, and that means you've got to keep on looking around the world. So it means you've got to have a community of people around the world. And it struck me, when you get this data from these people in Burma or wherever they are, you'll want to be able to test it. And if you have an international website and you can say, have you been to Burma? When were you last there? How long were you there? Do you speak the local languages? Well, then, would you like to evaluate this data and help us to check whether the data is right? We can then ask if we can get some satellite pictures to help them to check on that data. We thus grade it up and we categorize it. When I say we, I mean the algorithm does. Again, this is something which I simply learned from John. It can be done automatically for a very large part of the business. Automatically, it categorizes data as indicating that this is an early warning zone, a conflict zone getting serious, and then we might get to the stage of saying it's an alarm zone. Who's it for, though? Because for the State Department and the Foreign Office have got their own systems. Haven't it's they? a matter of giving them stuff which I have the impression they all will find helps a lot. They've all got, yes, of course, they've got diplomats on the ground who send them the data. Airlines have all got sources that send them the data. But none of them, from what I can gather, from what they've told me, have got the kind of up-to-date data that this would amount to. Because the fact is that when there's conflict going on, people are uploading it daily. And people are uploading words daily. The words, let us take murder, explosion, destruction, dead, ambulance. It's a very limited number of words. But again, I learned from John, it's probable that the algorithm could collect words for all the world's 6,000 languages, given it's only a small number of words in each language. So it'll be possible to provide to your friends in the Foreign Office or to my friends in the airline or whoever else it is, or the relatives of people in the conflict zone, data about the danger places that is later, more accurate, more tested than has previously been possible. And, and so... What does this have to do with conflict prevention? Ah, that's the next stage. And I'm very pleased that Jared is here, because while we three have talked about the way you get the data together and use it, I have some fixed ideas which I am prepared to put, but I think Jared may stamp on them if I put them. So I'd rather let that wait until he's had a word. We're a, uh, a small satellite imagery and mapping uh, uh, analysis sort of group based in Geneva, Switzerland. We're part of a broader organization called the UN Institute for Training and Research. So we're uh, an independent entity set up, set up several uh, decades ago. Uh, UNISAT basically provides operational imagery support to UN agencies and NGOs in accordance with UN policy. And so here's my disclaimer on how I'm not speaking for UN policy. I'm basically a contract analyst, so anything here is my own opinion. 
Uh, and we basically use a variety of commercial and scientific satellites for our work. Uh, nothing military, nothing classified or anything like that. It's essentially imagery on the open market. Uh, we consider this stuff to be a, a constellation of imaging assets that we'll bring in and use on everything from humanitarian disasters to land use planning to conflict situations and ideally uh, uh, conflict uh, prevention. And this is a, uh, a portion of a village called Tajale as it looked on uh, March 3rd. Uh, we knew there was, there was impending attacks in this area, so there were, we were getting imagery on a regular basis. Uh, this is essentially how it looked three days later. It was attacked on March 5th. We got the imagery on the morning of March 6th uh, and had the report out on the afternoon of March 6th uh, showing clear burning, clear destruction. And then uh, a variety of journalists confronted the U.S. State Department with uh, uh, this sort of reporting, which again just forces uh, uh, more policymakers to, to take on the issue as opposed to dealing with the other issues of the day. So Ushahidi came about in 2008 uh, during the uh, Kenyan election crisis. Um, there was riots, uh, if, you, if you aren't aware, there was riots around um, the electoral process and um, uh, a group of bloggers created this platform that essentially allowed them to take the comment forum, uh, uh, the comment thread from their blog, and uh, map the, visualize those, those comments geospatially. So taking the comments and just putting it on a map. Um, this blog had become sort of like a resource where people were going to this place to um, uh, get to, to share their ideas about what was going on, share their experiences, ask for help. Um, and they felt that this was going to be a resource for um, uh, the, the first responders and people who are coming to their assistance. Um, so uh, long story short, they decided to abstract that um, idea of mapping citizen reports uh, into an open source platform that uh, is now used uh, all around many different scenarios, uh, many different parts of the world. Um, most recently during the, the Japan quakes, um, the Russian fires, uh, a uh, number of uh, recent uh, disaster events, Haiti, um, uh, there was a use in Egypt. Um, and the platform has essentially become an open source tool for people to sort of self-organize around uh, disaster events. Reportage is going down. Newspapers are employing fewer people to go to those places. Television stations are employing fewer people. And a much larger proportion of the data is coming from the citizen reporters. Secondly, how do you use it? This is a technique that has to be injected into those with influence over those in conflict. Now, those with influence may be states, may be local people, may be businessmen, but they have to be given data which is going to make someone sit up straight away. Let me just tell you one little anecdote. Years ago, Slobodan Milosevic gave an interview to one of my teams. And it happened that it was on the day of the Srebrenica massacre. And one of my colleagues asked him very courteously about Serb violence against other peoples in Yugoslavia. And he replied, what? Us? Ridiculous. Denial is one of the standard tools of those engaging in violence. Giving information which is incontrovertible, and sometimes it may be a day or two old, but some of it may be actually today's information, which simply says, look, this is a picture of what your people are doing in that village today. If you go on with that, it's going to be terrible for you. It's actually going to be damaging for us. And we urge you to stop. And maybe urge is not all. Does making, bringing the public into intelligence by open sourcing intelligence make a difference politically? When I talked to Tunisian activists about the role that WikiLeaks played, they said, we didn't need WikiLeaks to tell us how corrupt Ben Ali's government was, but we're glad WikiLeaks showed all of you how corrupt Ben Ali's government was. A young girl on the streets of Tehran named Neda Sultan was brutally shot either by Ansari Hezbollah or Basijis, Iran, you know, various versions of Iran's sta uh, security apparatus. And she was murdered by, uh, you know, on the streets. It was caught on a, a video camera on a phone. Uh, we don't know who that person was, who, who captured it, but the video, if any of you haven't seen it, was extraordinarily horrific. Um, it is something that would have touched the soul of anybody that saw it. Uh, so something extraordinary happened next, which is, again, we don't know who took that video. I don't know if they were male, female, rich, poor, politically active, an innocent bystander. I have n we know nothing about them other than the fact that within hours, that video, despite everything being shut down in the country, 
was disseminated to enough people in the country to get it out of the country, and within three hours, that video was on the desks of some of the most powerful and least accessible people on the planet. The fact is that getting data into the hands of these people, getting new, up-to-date, and well-authenticated data will help them to have dialogues that will be of value. Precisely how that's going to happen, I can't say, but that the data is becoming available increasingly and that it can be used to that purpose with each of these various groups seems to me incontrovertible. I'd just like to add one point about governments. Jared made a remark about governments not doing things that were against their interests. So, of course, you don't want to send this data to all the governments around the world. You want to send it to the government that has a specific interest in the avoidance of war in that particular zone. If the data is good enough, it will go viral. If it goes viral, it will convince not just the governments that you would initially target, but it would convince a whole bunch of governments that would say it's against their moral imperative. Because now that it's become a public diplomacy problem, it's all of a sudden in their bureaucratic interest to do it. And so you know, I, I really, I think the days of having to rely on governments to be the sole proprietors of intervention are, are over. I mean, it, governments have few resources. They have diplomatic tactics and they have militaries. And the most effective interventions are gonna be everything in between. You know, the problem in Rwanda, it wasn't just that the government failed to act, it's that the government made intervention synonymous with full-scale military commitment, and so they had two options, that and doing nothing. And intervention, we never look at the middle options. And I'm just not convinced that governments are the best equipped to come up with those military oper operations, I, the, the middle operations. I think they can create space for it, I think they can help it, but ultimately the ideas on how to do that are not gonna come from governments. Well, on, on that rather hopeful uh, tone, I think we'll leave it. Thank you very much indeed, uh, all, our, all our members of the panel.